Good afternoon and welcome to session three of our pediatric roundtable discussion with the Lurie Children's Division of Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition. My name is Chad Worley, Lurie Children's Physician Liaison for the City North and North and Northwest Suburbs. I am here with our host, Dr. Barry Werschel, Division Head for Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition. But before I send it over to Dr. Werschel, I would just like to let you all know that we have a few handouts available to download. We have some uh, brochures from our GI department that will, uh, you would find handy. Um, I will also be sending those out by email with our uh, links to the recording. We have a survey and a poll um, for you to fill out if uh, you're so inclined. And then lastly, I really encourage you to ask questions in the question and chat room. And then after our discussion with Dr. Joshua Wechsler, who's gonna talk about child, the child with suspected food allergy, the GI perspective, um, we will answer all the questions afterwards uh, with a little discussion. Um, and if you're so inclined, raise your hand and we'll unmute you and you can ask a question live as well. So without um, further ado, I'm just gonna go ahead and send it over to Dr. Werschel. Um, Dr. Werschel, take it away, please. Great, thank you, Chad. Um, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and welcome to the third um, session of the virtual GI um, forum. Um, I'm Dr. Barry Werschel. I'm the head of the Division of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition at Lori Children's. <clears throat> I um, did my training in, uh, at Washington University and St. Louis Children's Hospital. Um, moved on to a fellowship in the combined program of pediatric gastroenterology at Harvard, and then spent the next 15 years of my career as a basic scientist understanding, trying to understand the um, mucosal immune system, how it functions and how it uh, is regulated. Um, with that experience, I've been able to, um, to take on the challenge of, of heading the Division of Gastroenterology here at, um, at Lori Children's. Um, I've been here for 14, 13 and a half years, approaching 14, um, and it's certainly been a, an, an honor to lead a, a very distinguished group of, of physicians and support staff um, that has grown to become one of the more prominent um, pediatric GI divisions, not just in the state of Illinois, but in the country. We have consistently ranked in the top <coughs> GI HEP programs in the country, um, as determined by US News and World Report, with the number one program in the state of Illinois. We currently have 23 attending physicians and 11 nurse practitioners and um, advanced practice nurses who work um, at 12 different sites uh, ringing the uh, city of Chicago, um, with our newest sites being at Skokie and at Glenview. Um, you know, the Division of GI is a very diverse um, um, entity. Um, we have this, we have our core responsibilities for focusing on common GI problems, but a very important responsibility um, <clears throat> to have subspecialty programs dealing with problems that <clears throat> um, cannot otherwise be uh, managed by other, other programs. Uh, so therefore, things like um, our hepatology and liver transplant program, our eosinophilic esophagitis program, our shortcut program, our IBD program, um, just to name a few, our, our motility program, these are, these are very highly specialized programs um, that run primarily centered at um, Lori Children's, but I do want to emphasize the fact that while much of our advanced endoscopy program is, is housed at the, the main hospital, we have a very robust um, endoscopy program running at both Northbrook and Westchester, where we're able to do um, the bread and butter kinds of procedures that are important to gastroenterology and the evaluation of children with, with GI symptoms. So um, we have a very um, diverse um, set of talks um, that have been going on through the course of the day. And um, I'm very um, proud to um, introduce the next speaker, Dr. Josh Wexler, 
is the director of our eosinophilic uh, gastrointestinal diseases program at Lori Children's. He has the distinction of being chosen as a uh, Cured Foundation research scholar, Cured being the campaign urging research in eosinophilic diseases. Josh did his medical training um, at, uh, at here in Chicago, did his residency at Riley Children's Hospital in, in Indianapolis, um, and then we were fortunate enough to have him come back um, as a fellow in gastroenterology at Lori Children's um, and subsequently take a, on a position here. Josh has really become um, one of the, the, the young guns um, around the country um, championing the um, evaluation and the treatment of, of children with eosinophilic diseases of the GI tract and on the forefront of, of developing and studying um, new biologic agents and, and various therapies that are, are um, coming on, on board. Um, I think in your practice, you're going to, you're all faced with these children that you suspect may have a food allergy. Um, and it becomes important to try to understand which, how is it that the allergist might um, help you in the evaluation of these children? How is it that the gastro, what's the role that the gastroenterologist might play in the evaluation of these children? Um, so there's a distinct GI perspective. Um, and Josh is going to be talking to us uh, today about uh, that child with suspected food allergy and how we approach it as a gastroenterologist, how we can help you to evaluate and take care of your patient. So Josh, I turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I am absolutely delighted to talk to everybody about food allergies. My, my career has been very interesting in that I knew very early that I wanted to be uh, a physician scientist. And in fact, the, la the last thing I figured out was that I wanted to be a, a gastroenterologist. And somehow along the way, I fell in love with allergic conditions. And so it really was a natural fit that I ended up being a, an eosinophilic esophagitis. Uh, focused uh, gastroenterologist. But today I'm going to talk to you about the child with suspected food allergy and the GI perspective around that. And my objectives are to present some cases that raise questions regarding an intestinal food allergy in children, to discuss food allergic conditions, their presentation, natural history, and treatment, and the, then to discuss when to refer to GI versus allergy. And of course, at the very end, there'll be plenty of time for questions. And I'm going to do this through a case-based format. So the very first case I'm going to start with is an infant with diarrhea. And so in this case, it's a four-week-old male with irritability for two weeks, full term, formula fed starting one week after birth, small flecks of blood in the stool. Uh, the stooling is frequent eight times daily. There's frequent spitting up. It's non-bilious. It's non non bloody. It's non-bilious. The child's gaining weight otherwise, but there's frequent irritability with spitting up and stooling. And I want to contrast that to case number two, which is another infant with diarrhea. And this infant is an eight-month-old female with intermittent diarrhea and vomiting over the last month. And in this infant, the, the child was breastfed since birth, but since solid food introduction, particularly rice cereal, has had intermittent episodes of severe vomiting and diarrhea. With two of the episodes presented to the ER for IV fluids, the vomiting is again non-bloody, non-bilious, the diarrhea is non-bloody itself, and the vomiting and diarrhea tend to occur several hours after eating rice cereal. And so you can see really between these two cases uh, some similarities, although they, uh, they'll ultimately be completely different etiologies. Now case three and case four are quite similar, and case three is a toddler with vomiting. And so case three is a four-year-old that has intermittent vomiting for three months. And in this child, the child was previously well, has a history of eczema, had a poor response to acid medicine that was trialed by the pediatrician, is noted to take longer time, longer at meal times to finish food, is picky but, and doesn't really like meats, uh, but eats fruits and vegetables when they're cooked, uh, and sometimes spits out food. So in many senses, a lot of normal um, ch childhood behaviors um, intermixed uh, with, with some vomiting that uh, is of concern to the family. And contrast that to a four-year-old female with vomiting after eating cashews. And in this child, uh, within 20 minutes of consuming food, there's an itchy rash and coughing. 
And typically the vomiting will occur after lots of coughing. Uh, the vomiting is again, non-bloody, non-bilious, normal growth, and again, a history of infantile eczema. So all these cases have numerous similarities, um, but really ultimately speak to different etiologies that need to have di both different, work, different types of providers uh, managing them and ultimately different workups and treatments. And so in case number one, we're talking about milk protein enterocolitis. Case number two, food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome. Case number three, eosinophil esophagitis. And case number four, Ig mediated food allergy. So now we'll talk about each of those conditions individually, um, what's known about the condition, uh, the natural history, uh, and, how they, and how we treat them by and large. So milk protein enterocolitis, which is also known um, to many as cow's milk protein intolerance or CMPI, you'll often see it written as. And this is really thought to be an abnormal immune response to cow's milk protein largely, can occur with other proteins, but largely cow's milk protein, um, whereby there's inflammation of the small and large intestine. That is to say, if we put a camera in, we would find some amount of inflammation, largely in fact, eosinophilic. It's an overall uncommon condition thought to occur in up to maybe three or 5% of infants. Uh, that's based on prevalence studies uh, of this condition. Usually develops in the first week of the first week of starting a cow's milk protein based formula, but it can occur in breastfed babies as well, exclusively breastfed babies as well. Often very much confused with GERD. And I think the case I presented to some extent illustrates why. And sort of historically speaking, most of the cases of, of vomiting, similar to what I presented, were in fact thought to be GERD and treated like GERD and often failed treatment as a result of that. Uh, the symptoms are wide ranging, including GERD-like symptoms, stool changes, blood in the stool, irritability, and poor weight gain. And so you really have a broad amount of symptoms whereby you have to link it back to this idea of milk protein enterocolitis or milk protein intolerance, because it ultimately informs um, the likely work, the necessary workup, the appropriate workup, and really ultimately the right treatment. And of course, this is a clinical diagnosis. We really don't do tests to prove it exists. We might do tests to say it's not something else, but at the end of the day, this is really a clinical, a clinical syndrome. We don't do scopes really on these patients to identify patholo pathology within the tissue, uh, largely because of the risk of doing procedures uh, in patients this age and the ultimate uh, ability to diagnose this clinically and then successfully treat it. So the natural history of this disease process is that it typically resolves late in the first year of life or typically soon after 12 months of age. Some children will develop ig mediated food allergy who have this condition. Uh, the, the estimates on that are variable depending on the study. Early reintroduction of less hypoallergenic foods may in fact be beneficial. There are studies that have examined uh, food reintroduction much earlier than 12 months. And while it's not successful for all, it can be successful for some, whether or not that per ultimately prevents a food allergy, as is suggested by uh, more recent data from the UK, from Israel, looking at early introduction of foods. Certainly that's not well known in this population in particular. Um, the introduction of these foods, uh, of less hypoallergenic foods, is typically overseen by a gastroenterologist. Um, and from a treatment standpoint, uh, not surprisingly, these patients are very responsive to removal of cow's milk protein with improvement in the symptoms and oftentimes decreased spitting up and irritability, decreased irritability. The, there's the benefits of removing additional foods have mixed results in studies, um, although you often find that patients are removing soy from the diet or for breastfeeding mom removing milk or soy. And in fact, I've heard parents tell me they removed this or that food and that was ultimately what did it. And, the, the, the yield on making recommendations regarding foods outside of uh, cow's milk is really where it becomes more limited. Uh, for breastfed babies, mom can remove cow's milk protein. As I mentioned, some often remove soy protein from the diet, although that doesn't have entirely clear proven benefits, but we often do it. Um, and if the response is poor, a hypoallergenic formula, typically an elemental formula where all of the uh, intact protein is replaced by single amino acids, is often needed. And of course, in that case, you certainly need a dietitian on board to really help manage uh, the growth and the intake there. There's really no role for an H2 blocker or a PPI in management. I think that's really important. There's really no data out there to suggest that H2 blockers and PPIs have much benefit in conditions like this at all. Um, it's frequently managed by, um, by GI, particularly as if there's nutrition concerns, as, by man if I, as I mentioned. So now food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome. 
Um, so this is really rare, less than 1% of infants. Um, slight male predilection uh, typically occurs about one to four weeks following um, whatever that trigger foods introduction is, typically in the first year. Um, it involves profuse projectile vomiting and diarrhea, often, as I mentioned, necessitating ER visits or hospitalization, starting about one to four hours following food exposure. And the common foods associated with this are cow's milk, soy, rice, and oats, but truly any food can actually cause this condition. And it's really the stereotypical history that really clues you into it. Oftentimes that can be very challenging as children have uh, a variety of foods uh, that are increasing in the diet over time, and that can make it quite challenging to find that one or two specific triggers. And it can be more than one trigger as well. It can involve lethargy and changes in blood pressure. And so, like I said, medical evaluation is, is commonly needed. It's often misdiagnosed as a stomach bug, not surprisingly, uh, but there, again, the repeated nature of it is really what is ultimately the clue. Uh, and there's no specific testing, and this is a non ig mediated condition, so there's no need for an EpiPen per se. It's a clinical diagnosis, um, uh, but you can do supervised oral food challenge tests for diagnosis as well. Um, and this is managed specifically by an allergist. Um, and there's also a condition called atypical f -pies, and this is where um, f -pies is thought to be the condition, and it occurs in a setting of Ig antibodies to the causative food. Um, this is, of course, uncommon, but not surprisingly associated with the development of other atopic diseases or often ig mediated food allergy itself. The natural history of FPIs is that it resolves in the vast majority of patients by ages three to five. Oral food challenge with an allergist can be used to confirm the specific foods, as I mentioned. Patients with solid food FPIs, this is foods beyond cow's milk, take longer to resolve, as well as those with concomitant IgE uh, to the food trigger. Uh, and patients who develop FPIs at a later age are not surprisingly, they take longer to resolve as well. 30% develop atopic disease, and in fact, 5% develop EOE. I, that, was a, that was recently uh, determined in a study in the last couple of years. Caregivers of FPIs also report very low health-related quality of life. I think that's an important thing that has been noted in this patient population because of the intensity and repeatability of these symptoms and oftentimes the difficulty in finding the specific food triggers. Treatment of FPIs is food avoidance, of course. It's the mainstay of preventing episodes. Prednisone is recommended for patients with severe dehydration and hypotension. This is typically under the guide of an allergist uh, or, of course, like an emergency room physician or some, somebody in the inpatient setting. Emergency treatment plan can be beneficial for the family to know that urgent ED evaluation is beneficial. I think that's really the take-home point here is, is that uh, where we give emergency action plans for patients with asthma. In fact, this is a condition where understanding that this trajectory of symptoms and how severe it can get is really important for the family. Um, and so guiding them to really directly ultimately to the ED is, is really only gonna expedite uh, the, ch the child's safety and recovery. The introduction of green vegetables and then fruits at four to six months of age instead of cereals is suggested because approximately one third of the infants with milk or soy FPIs will ultimately develop solid food FPIs and reactions to rice and other grains represent the most common types of solid food FPIs. So this is something that's been increasingly recognized over time with this condition. Um, and this is something certainly that an allergist uh, can discuss with the family and, and work with the nutritionist, if a dietitian if necessary uh, for help with the nutrition. All right, eosinophilic esophagitis, no doubt my favorite topic in life. Uh, it's increasingly more common. We used to say one in 2,500. Now I think we can convincingly say one in 1,000. I'm sure quite soon it's going to be much more than that. Uh, this is a male predominant disease, about three to one. That male predominance tends to go away much later in life, like in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. But for children and, and, and adults, uh, this tends to be somewhat male predominant. Uncommon in the first year of life. So it's very odd that we see cases that were diagnosed at eight or nine months. Typically, we're seeing cases that were diagnosed maybe as early as about 15 or 18 months, um, but most of our kids are diagnosed, of course, much, much, much later than that. The symptoms in older children are, are primarily dysphagia and esophageal food impaction, that is feeling food stuck at the chest. And when we talk about dysphagia, it comes in multiple varieties, but ultimately the idea that the food takes longer to go down is difficult to swallow or, in fact, feels stuck all falls under the breath of dysphagia. The symptoms in younger children can be variable. Uh, vomiting, food refusal, extra chewing, extra food with solids, coughing with meals, food pocketing. And in fact, some of these symptoms, uh, which are somewhat accommodative, like the extra fluids, the extra chewing, the cough, 
the food pocketing, these can also be seen in older kids as an accommodative behavior. And in some cases, you don't really see dysphagia because the accommodative behaviors are in fact in charge. And many parents will ignore these, th these symptoms for quite some time until the child in fact presents with a food impaction in the emergency room. And that's oftentimes the first step point at which we diagnose eosinophilic esophagitis. Most have comorbid atopy in our population here in, in the Chicago area. It's probably 70 or 80 percent, mostly with allergic rhinitis, hay fever, seasonal allergies, perennial allergies, um, but about half will have eczema or, as, or asthma, uh, and about a third or so will have ig mated food allergy. Can be associated with um, other non-atopic conditions, and so the big one that we've really um, uh, begin to ask questions about in clinic now is hypermobility. Um, and so the sort of broad category of hypermobility, but on the end of the spectrum being connective tissue disease, um, things that affect obviously joint pain, chronic fatigue oftentimes, and really can require PT and a lots of vigorous exercise really for the patient to have a better response. And then POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, really sort of uh, 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 presents with uh, postural dizziness. Um, and it can often be worse in the setting of a deconditioning uh, whereby you have someone that was very active and then has an abrupt period uh, with, a, with a lot of decreased activity. In fact, we've seen quite a bit of it during the pandemic, not surprisingly. Um, and of course, EOE requires endoscopy with biopsies, um, as do all eosinophilic gastrointestinal diseases, uh, to diagnose them by gastroenterologists. Um, and so that's really, really, really important. We cannot diagnose it with a blood test. We cannot diagnose it just clinically. We have to diagnose it using endoscopy. That is the gold standard for diagnosis, and it's also the gold standard for assessing the response to treatment as well as surveillance for fibrostenosis. The natural history is, is that long-term untreated active disease. And when we say active disease, we're talking about a specific degree of eosinophil counts that appear on the biopsy. Um, but this untreated active EOE leads to fibrostenosis of the esophagus and the ultimate development of an esophageal stricture. And as you might imagine, with an esophageal stricture, things are going to get stuck right on top of that stricture, particularly things like meats. Um, and that's where that presentation of emergent esophageal food impaction is with the need for endoscopy to pull that food out. The concern, again, like I just mentioned, with esophageal uh, stricture is the food impaction. Um, and really, the only treatment once you have an, uh, a narrowing is repeated mechanical dilation. Um, and really, their medical therapy ultimately that reduces inflammation, maybe prevents to some extent restructuring, um, but ultimately doesn't actually make a stricture go away. And of course, these patients need repeated endoscopy over their lifetime for surveillance. Um, and there are New tools to assess fibrostenosis. The big new tool that we're using now is called EndoFlip. This is a balloon with a catheter in the middle that can effectively measure the distensibility and compliance and ultimately the diameter of the esophagus can really give us advanced warning on the extent of fibrostenosis that's developing in our patients. It has to some extent a measure of motility, although not perfect. Um, and even there's additional tools that I didn't write down here, like transnasal endoscopy. This is where we put the camera through the nose and a lot allows us to bypass the need for anesthesia. And, uh, and then even more up and coming um, is uh, the use of a swallowed string where there's a capsule with a string attached to it. And this has not really become mainstream clinically yet more in the research level. But I imagine at some point may be a tool that we end up using clinically. The transnasal endoscopy and the endoflip we are using clinically. And of course, balloon endoscopic dilation um, as is relevant for uh, narrowings of the esophagus. Now, treatments for EOE, so diet elimination has long been, long been recognized for over 25 years as a treatment for EOE. Started off as being elemental diet, um, so very burdensome, cumbersome on the need for endoscopy. Uh, evolved ultimately to the removal of six foods, the top, the top six, top eight, dairy, soy, wheat, egg, the nuts, peanuts, tree nuts, the uh, seafood, fish and shellfish. We rapidly recognized that dairy, wheat, soy, and egg were really ultimately the most common foods. So we then transitioned into a four-fed approach uh, and really ultimately now realize that cow's milk or dairy um, is really ultimately the predominant trigger for at least half of all children with EOE, it appears. Uh, and so our first pass diet elimination is ultimately dairy elimination now uh, for the vast majority. We take away goat's milk and sheep's milk as well, though that's very uncommon for children to consume, uh, except in cheese form.
pharmacologic treatment is of course an option. So the big one is peak that that's really different in the last several years is proton pump inhibitors or PPIs, things like omeprazole, uh, lansoprazole, pantoprazole. And we commonly use these drugs twice daily, not necessarily at uh, a markedly higher dose per se, uh, but somewhere in the one to two per kilo range uh, per, uh, per day. So about one per kilo per dose uh, given twice daily seems that it works better twice daily. And this may in fact relate to polymorphisms in the metabolism of PPIs. Um, and PPIs really were long considered a diagnostic modality for EOE, whereby you would fail the PPI scope and find EOE, and we would say those patients have EOE. Now we broadly consider PPIs a therapy, and the folks that respond to that, we say are PPI responders uh, that have EOE. And, uh, and then those patients will keep them on long-term PPIs. Uh, as, as well for primary treatment. Now, if you don't, if that doesn't work and if diet therapy is not really a consideration, the, the mainstay of therapy then is swallowed steroids. Um, and the two big ones are swallowed fluticasone and swallowed budesonide. Fluticasone comes as a meter dose inhaler. The patients hold it up to their mouth without the spacer, press it, swallow, press and swallow. Therefore, they're swallowing the powder. It's coating the esophagus. And really the main risk of that is candida of the esophagus, which occurs in about 5% of cases. We do monitor for things like adrenal insufficiency, bone density, linear growth, but largely speaking, in the vast, vast, vast majority of patients, that's not going to be seen. With budesonide, we use a viscous slurry, and so we mix that slurry with a small amount of Splenda, honey, or pancake syrup, um, and the patients take either of these medicines twice a day with nothing to eat or drink for 30 minutes to allow for a dwell time, and, um, and then we let them eat or drink unrestricted after that. And then what's changing now in the last few years is the emergence of biologics. And in phase two, three trials right now are all of the drugs I've shown below. Uh, dupilumab, which targets the AL4 receptor, benralizumab, which targets the AL5 receptor, and lirantilumab, which targets Siglet 8. And all of these drugs serve to either ramp down type 2 inflammation, so inflammation is seen with asthma, eczema, things like that, they, or in the case of benralizumab and lirantilumab, they actually kill eosinophils. Um, and in the case of lirantilumab, also shut off mast cell activation. And these are very promising approaches, uh, but still in, in clinical trials right now. So likely something we'll see in a few years as being mainstays, particularly for patients that are refractory to all of the treatments that I listed above. Mechanical dilation, of course, that's technically a treatment, but we don't encourage our patients to use mechanical dilation alone uh, for a variety of reasons. Of course, symptom burden, and then ultimately um, the hospital potential ER uh, need for emergent endoscopy. Uh, IG mediated food allergy, it's rapid onset, as probably you all know, typically within minutes from the time of ingestion. Um, there's also a specific type called alpha gal, which can be more delayed, and this is a type of a food allergy, in fact, a red meat. Um, the key symptoms of the typical food allergy, of which the most common ones are things like cow's milk and, and soy and nuts, peanuts, tree nuts, or fish and shellfish, um, are urticaria uh, or hives, angioedema, facial swelling, or difficulty breathing, um, ultimately that we call anaphylaxis. Uh, GI symptoms are, in fact, very common. And so, commonly speaking, they can be seen as the most common problem, and then may, that may be, therefore, what's identifiable to the family. They may not see the hives. Um, there may not always be angioedema and difficulty breathing in all cases. Um, and so, really, a lot of the history is very, very important. Um, but this is a life-threatening condition, um, in some ways similar to FPIs. It's life-threatening, of course, for the breathing reasons. Um, and, and really needs to be uh, uncovered quickly uh, for uh, epinephrine um, injectables to be, to be prescribed. Um, in addition, there's also there, um, similar conditions um, that provide similar symptoms. Uh, a big notable one is oral allergy syndrome, or commonly called pollen food allergy syndrome. And this is the immediate onset of itching, irritation, or mild swelling of the lips, tongues, uh, palate with ingestion of uncooked fruits and vegetables. And this is ultimately actually a cross-reaction of pollen. Um, and so it's really important really to sort of think about these various conditions and ultimately refer to an allergist really for further workup because this is a condition where testing is actually quite valuable. And so testing with IgE or commonly called RAS to specific foods along with skin prick or patch testing is something that is, is to be performed by an allergist. And 
while the, the technical gold standard for diagnosing a food allergy is an in-office food challenge, uh, most commonly allergists will use a, his, a clinical history with rapid reactivity along with the testing that I list here uh, to make a diagnosis in order to prescribe uh, epinephrine uh, uh, as an injectable for treatment of uh, severe, severe reactions. Um, now, the natural history of this disease is that most patients will outgrow food allergy due to something called the induction of oral tolerance. Um, up to 80% of food allergy in the first year of life is resolved by age three. Um, less common in patients with peanut or tree nut, so those food allergies, in fact, will last longer, oftentimes into adulthood. And we're now seeing this rash of adult onset food allergy coming, so I think there's less known about that, in fact. Um, adult onset, as I mentioned, is now being increasingly recognized. Um, there's, of course, not surprisingly very poor health-related quality of life because patients have oftentimes an inability to identify uh, places where they can consume food safely. Um, and, uh, and this is oftentimes due to things like cross-contamination where although they can readily identify their food, uh, the preparation technique often mixes uh, food particles together and contaminates food. Uh, this occurs in the food production process or, or in the food preparation process, both at homes and in restaurants, of course, uh, and can be, a, do, it can be a limitation on, on the quality of life of patients and what have, what's accessible to them. This is also very much true of eosinophil esophagitis patients who are on uh, diet elimination therapies. Uh, from, a, from the standpoint of treatment, food avoidance is, of course, the mainstay. Uh, retesting with RAST and skin press, prep testing to determine the readiness for food reintroduction by an allergist. And then more recently, we're seeing children now treated with oral immunotherapy or OIT. Um, this is where you have slow, long-term, deliberate, and increasing amounts of allergen exposed to the patient's mouth. So they've given it on the, on the tongue, swallowed. And um, it does require very a lot of, it's very chronic, typically daily. Or it can, it, it, and, it, and, and there can be a lot of reactions to it. EOE, in fact, can develop in a small number of these patients as a consequence of EOE and of, of OIT and then becomes a contraindication to the OIT at that point as well. Um, and there's been the development um, uh, of patches that can be used for cow's milk. And, um, and to my understanding, these are really still in, in clinical trials I and mean, have really not hit uh, main, the mainstream yet as far as treatment options. Patients, of course, should be followed by an allergist, and really that's, there's a necessity to have something like an EpiPen provided for them. Antihistamines can be useful in managing reactions, but ED visits are often need needed if there's any respiratory symptoms. So again, having something like an action plan is quite useful, and this is something that can be reviewed with the patient, uh, no, no doubt, when they, when they go see their allergist. Um, so where to, where, where to refer? So milk protein enterocolitis, oftentimes this is managed by GI, particularly for nutrition concerns. FPI is an allergist, particularly for the need for uh, oral food challenge to confirm food triggers uh, in a hospital setting. Eosinophil esophagitis, GI, really because of the important management uh, using the endoscope. Um, but we oftentimes refer our patients to allergy as well for uh, management of comorbid allergic diseases. Um, or for the determination of the readiness for food reintroduction. If you've had prolonged avoidance of a food for longer than a year or more, we'll oftentimes do blood testing or if necessary, skin testing to ensure that there's not been interval development of a food allergy, ig mediated food allergy. And then ig mediated food allergies, that's really managed by an allergist for testing for food challenge and for EpiPen prescriptions. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. That was a great presentation. Thanks so much. That was great. So we do have uh, questions in, so I'm just going to go ahead and uh, get that started. But for the rest of you, I encourage you uh, to submit our questions. Uh, Dr. Michael Bauer sent in a question. And Dr. Bauer, would you like to um, just go ahead and ask your question um, uh, live and I'll unmute you? Hi there, thanks for the presentation. Can you hear me okay? We hear you great. Great, great. How often do you see um, eosinophilic gastroenteritis where it extends beyond the esophagus and you see positive biopsies, gastric, duodenal, et cetera? Yeah, excellent question. And at least from the standpoint of prevalence around the country, it's at least 10 if not more fold less prevalent than eosinophilic esophagitis. We often tell 
people, about one in 10,000, even up to maybe 150,000, depending on which part of the GI tract you're involved in. Most stomach is the most common place we would find it, followed by the small intestine, and really rarely would we find things in the colon. In fact, we really do have not seen patients much at all with the eosinophil colitis, except in the post transplant setting, LRE children. But we do have a small number of eosinophil gastroenteritis patients. I would say if we see about one patient every other month, that's probably about it, uh, relative to the, you know 20 to plus 30, 40 patients we're seeing um, uh, with eosinophil gastroenteritis a month. And do they ever outgrow, and this is both EE as well as the gastroenteritis, do they ever become tolerant and outgrow this, or is it lifelong? Yeah, another great question. So I have seen patients outgrow eosinophil esophagitis. Um, it tends to occur, in my opinion, and this is sort of not surprising, in patients that have had it, that once they go into remission, they've had a perfectly normal scope for years, and then all of a sudden you try to put something back. But the numbers of patients in which that actually occurs in is, is incredibly small. And there's one report that's looked at it, and in their series, this was from CHOP, they found it was 0.3%. And I would say that's probably not inaccurate. I probably have about four or five patients over the years that have seen while grown. And typically, they, they're found to have EOE as, a young, as very young patients, typically in the first or second year of life. Uh, in the EG, in the setting of EG, um, my experience is a bit different there. Typically, young, young children with EG, when you get them successfully treated, they oftentimes don't ever uh, flare their disease ever again. And so whether that's outgrowing the disease or not, um, I believe there's a good evidence of that. There's not published data on the extent to which that occurs. I tend to think with older children with genes that we diagnose with EGG, uh, we don't really see them outgrow it much at all. And um, and they're really lacking treatment options. And that's really, to a large extent, where these biologics likely will play a big role. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Bauer. Always great questions from you. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, if there's anybody else who'd like to ask questions, either raise your hand or write it in the chat room or the question room, and we'll get that answered for you. But um, while I'm waiting for that, I uh, just want to remind everybody that we have a 3 p.m. Uh, discussion that we're continuing and excited to introduce Dr. Amanda Wetzel. She is going to talk about practical approaches for reflux. And then we're going to have also Dr. Alan Pratt talking about constipation. So uh, very exciting uh, discussion at 3 o'clock. But it uh, looks like... We don't have any other questions in. So uh, Dr. Werschel, Dr. Wexler, do you have anything you'd like to add before we uh, dismiss the panel? So um, the, uh, the eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease program at Lori is really one of our um, marquee kind of programs in a sense um, because these are very complicated patients, families that are extremely distressed over their child's inability to eat um, and, the, and the effects it might have on their growth. We, um, we have a multidisciplinary approach where we have a dietitian, a gastroenterologist, um, an allergist available at, at the time of our our, um, our clinic sessions, all with which we can work together to address um, these families. And the one thing that I think, as Josh was going through um, the therapy, particularly for EOE, there's no one therapy that you can um, say, this is what we're gonna do for every single patient. It really takes a discussion, a, a period of education, um, and then looking at the family unit as a, each family is very individual. For some families, we've had teenagers that have done elemental diets. We've had um, teenagers who have gone on a milk only elimination have had emotional you know, collapse. Um, and so it really takes the expertise of somebody like Dr. Wexler um, and, and the group to help lead these families through this journey um, and, and spend the time that's necessary. The average time 
that we're spending with a, a new patient within the EOE program clearly exceeds over an hour and a half. Um, and it's just part of the commitment that we have to um, making sure that these families and these children with these problems are being taken care of properly. I think the other thing that I would add, and I mean, I completely agree with everything Dr. Warshall just said, is that one of the things that is really critical in EOE management is a very deliberate and stepwise approach. And a lot of the second and third opinions that we see at our center, that's actually one of the biggest issues, is, is that too many things were done at once and it's actually very difficult to uncover what effect what had and ensuring that you're not doing any harm to the patient as much as you're trying to help them. And um, these patients have a remarkably low quality of life. And so being comprehensive, having the accessibility of a world-class dietitian, all of the other supportive services at our hospital, like our connective tissue diseases clinic, our POTS clinic, um, these actually add quite significantly to the patient's quality of life uh, when you tackle all of these issues together. And I think our center is well recognized uh, for what we do in this domain. Thank you guys for that. Um, this, this again, this was a great presentation. And uh, I just want to let everybody know that if you want to contact Dr. Wexler, um, he can, his email is jwexler, J-W-E-C-H-S-L-E-R at lurychildrens.org, or you can reach him through Ep Rapid Connect or Epic In Basket. Um, and I'm sure he'd be delighted to hear from you. So uh, with that, I will um, say thank you. Uh, for joining us today and thank you dr Werschel and dr wexer for uh your great presentation today thank you thank you and we'll see you all at 3 p.m